This is my wife. Um, we'll be married 35 years, August 14th. And uh, so we're real, really excited about that. She grew up in a perfect home in Tennessee, Kentucky. Um, that is kind of a joke because, right, we're, we're all... We're all finite. There are really no perfect homes, but she did grow up in a much healthier home and atmosphere. Um, grew up in a pastor's home, Kentucky, Tennessee, and then they suffered for the Lord for three and a half years in Hawaii as missionaries. Um, and uh, but I, I grew up in Southeast Missouri. Grew up in a broken home. My parents divorced when I was about ten years old, and then my mom um, remarried and then divorced again and remarried again. Um, but I, I remember that uh, at age ten of. Um, we lived in the trailer court, and I remember waking up and my mom being gone, and I remember going from trailer to trailer trying to figure out where maybe mom spent the night the night before with my dad and my brother, and then to come to that last trailer and knock on the door and find out that my mom had um, left my dad, and I remember just the brokenness, and I, I remember the search. I remember at 10 years old a couple things. One, as I remember being out on the playground uh, I think maybe long before all the psychologists and the psychiatrists in the world we live in today, because I remember sitting out on the playground kind of all by myself at 10 or 11 years old going, there ought to be somebody who would care for somebody like me. And uh, just, just not knowing what that was like. But I, I, I remember my older brother and I uh, finding a bottle of uh, gin on the side of the road and thinking, well, maybe there's life in this, you know, and taking it and sticking it underneath the mattress. Now, some of you guys have been around longer than me, but it was like a half a bottle of gin and we would come home from school and we'd drink a little bit and we thought we were all that and a box of chocolates and now I think back and go you know I hope that was gin because people do other things with empty bottles right it's like ooh. but um it was pretty empty and, and I learned quick that that wasn't where life was found and and then my dad and mom had divorced and so he subscribed to Playboy and Penthouse, and long before you could have it on your phone, I'd come home from school and look through the magazines and let all those pictures infiltrate my mind. And um, That was an addiction that was probably four or five years long that took four or five years to get out of, and uh, very, very hard, painful. I remember um, going to my stepmom, soon-to-be stepmom, because my dad remarried, um, brother's trailer in Memphis, Tennessee, and they were smoking pot. And they said, man, this is like what King Henry smoked and Queen Elizabeth and George Washington. And I'm like, oh, that's where life is found. And smoking it and realizing that was pretty empty as well. Well, my mom and dad, when they um, uh, divorced, my mom was a single parent. And uh, she had a seven-year-old little girl and a brand new baby. And they moved uh, to Sykeston, Missouri, uh, on the same street as Tanner Street Church of God. And so a single mom, think about it, seven-year-old and a brand-new baby, and somebody from the church, um, still don't know to this day, walked down the sidewalk, walked up to my mom's house, and invited her to church. And that's why I'm here, is because somebody went one block over, knocked on the door, and said, um, why don't you come to church? And my brother, yeah, no, absolutely, it's God. And so my um, older brother got tired of living with me and my dad, and he moved in with my mom, and he started going to that church and got involved in a youth group. And uh, he gave his heart to the Lord, and he started praying for his lost little brother that was about 14, 15, that, uh, living with my dad. And uh, it was an old house in southeast, uh, southern Illinois. It had a coal furnace, and my dad is not a handyman. And he didn't know how to change the filters. And I, I kid you not, we'd wake up some morning and the whole house was filled full of coal smoke. And my eyes would be swollen shut. But I still had to go to school in about first period. They'd open up again. <laughs> and uh, never took a bath. I really, I don't think I ever took a bath. But when I went to my mom's house, man, it was clean up your act, right? My mom was like the disciplinarian. But all the while, this youth group and um, my brother was praying that I'd come to know the Lord. And every other weekend I would go to my mom's and then I, I kind of liked it and would go every weekend and I would go to a church. I was involved in a church youth group, um, but I was very, very uh, self-esteem about that low and very intimidated by church people and church crowd, but yet felt something different when I walked in. And uh, it was on a Sunday night sitting right back in that corner where I'm like, okay, this is what I've been searching for. I was probably uh, eighth grade maybe, walked down, gave my heart to the Lord, and walked back, and was never the same, just never, I mean, I, my, my life was totally transformed by Jesus, um, the cornerstone, and the weak made strong, and I, 
I tell people all the time, my life verse is John 8, 36. Um, if the Son will set you free, you'll be free indeed. Because I had all the freedom in the world. My dad let me do anything I wanted, but on the inside I was tore up. And I had ulcers, and I drank that Mylanta stuff to coat my stomach. But when I went back to the altar, not only was I free on the outside, but I was free on the inside for the first time in my life. And if any um, guys or young people or even women today are um, battling pornography, um, I was really set free from everything but that. That was a fight, and that took some time to get set free from. And uh, i just tell you a little bit of my story because I, I want you to know if you're here today and you wandered into Bridgewater Church or you've been attending a long time, um, the God of this age blinds the minds of unbelievers. So the God of this age, if you're like, I, I'm going to church, I'm going with my somebody because they invited me to go, but I really don't get it, I don't understand it, it's the God of this age. He blinds your eyes. And uh, just know that people are praying for you that the God who is God would open your eyes and that you would see. Um, because that's where the power comes from. It's where the transformation comes from. It's the change comes from. Is from Jesus Christ. Um, this verse, uh, not verse, but this phrase um, is really my only goal this morning is for you to walk out of here and have that phrase in your brain. So I'll just tell you ahead of time but to focus on the seed in the ground and not the dirt all around. Um, if you want to go to the text that we're going to preach from this morning, um, John 12, um, 20 to about 26 is um, the text that we're going to focus on and that I'm going to preach from. Um, but I kind of want to lead into it a little bit, um, not, with, not with too much more of my story, but, but you get it, right? Vicki grew up in a really healthy home, um, a home that was uh, put together. Her parents kind of in some ways became my parents because they, they, they became my daddy and mommy because they gave me a picture of what I wanted to see and see how to make it happen. Um, and I grew up in a pretty, pretty tough world. I went down to Warner Southern College in Central Florida um, to prepare for pastoral ministries. And I got away from my youth pastor who was very charismatic and said we need preacher boys. And whenever I was in youth group, every guy, I guess we didn't know we could have preacher girls, but every guy would fall, come down front and commit to be a preacher boy. Well, I get down to Warner, and I go, God, did you really call me to this? Or did I just kind of get sucked into a trance? So I changed my major to Bible. I was helping to build a missionary training village in Central Florida that still exists today called Heart. That's trained about 1,100 people and sent them to about 90 different countries in the world. And I got behind in Greek, and you can't get behind in Greek. If you get behind in Greek, you're done. So I changed my major again to sociology. <laughs> And so I have a major in sociology, your pastor this morning, and a minor in missions. And um, I was really on my way to Ohio State to get my master's in international development when God came in. And uh, the pastor at the local church, the youth pastor, had left and said, will you be the youth pastor here for a year? You, Vicki and I were married um, for a couple of years before that. And said, um, will you uh, be the youth pastor while we look? And what's the least amount of money you can get by on? And uh, so I had a missionary heart and told him the least amount of money I could get by on it. It wasn't enough. And so I ran a paper route the first couple of years um, and to make ends meet. But um, that's, that's just a little bit about me. Today we live in Anderson. And as Pastor Aaron said, um, I retired, aged out, I guess, uh, of youth ministry um, two years ago, August 2014, I guess three years ago. And now I'm the pastor of married people and global engagement. And uh, not a title that you really necessarily want to have. Um, because people come up and go, hey, can I tell you about my marriage? And uh, it's usually not a really good story. And it's usually an hour and a half long. Just, just, just so you know. Um, but I grew up in a different world than we live in today. And many of you guys probably as well. But things have changed, have they not? Um, the world's changed in the last uh, 37 years. Um, it's not the same. Uh, today in Anderson, Indiana, we have a Buddhist temple. Um, the LGBTQ plus is becoming more and more acceptable. The um, cohabitating, the political landscape's going crazy. Wars and conflicts are threatening. Um, random shootings, um, the refugee crisis, race issues, and there's so much more. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, you had Don and Carolyn Armstrong here, and uh, they were talking about what's going on in Asia. And, and uh, my son is, uh, my 21-year-old is over off the coast of Guam in the Micronesia Islands in Yap. And uh, so that's been fun because as I got ready to preach this morning in first service, he was going to bed 14 hours ahead of time. And he had preached over there um, when I was going to bed. Anyway, you can figure that out. It's kind of weird. Um, 
But, but, but when you start focusing on all the world's problems, all the world's issues, all the things that are going on, you can get so overwhelmed. And when I was at Warner Southern, it, I mean, it was like an ivory tower. I never read the newspaper, never watched the news, whatever. It was just kind of this deal. And yet I know that I'm a part of this world, so I need to know what's going on. And so, so I, I'm not standing before you going like, just saying, don't be in touch with the world. I actually get this magazine called The Week Magazine. I get it every Saturday, and I pretty much read it all the way through. And uh, I, th- this is, I could go into detail, but it's, it's this magazine. It's not a Christian magazine, but it, it has a way of kind of telling you what's going on all over the world, and it tells you, hey, this is what the Republicans are saying, and this is what the Democrats are saying, but it doesn't tell me how to think. It lets me think on my own, and I like it. And I, and I, but, I, but, I, I, but there's just so much stuff you know, that's going on all over the world that you can become so overwhelmed. And if that is not enough, <laughs> then you have the tyranny of the urgent that can begin to consume your life. You know, Vicki and I are now fathers of six children. We have four, two are married, so now we have six kids. We have three grandkids and one on the way, and we, we love that. But, um, you know, we've been married for 35 years, and if you're married, it is not easy. If you're thinking about getting married and you think it's just a cakewalk, forget it, it's not true. Marriage is tough, it's hard, but it's worth it. Because whatever you invest in, you get a great return from. If you don't invest in your marriage, you get no return. And it take, to, to make the very best us, and you're the only us, it will take both of us. But when you, when you invest, it's worth it. But, it's, but all of those kind of things, you know, we pay bills just like you pay bills. We have ministries or job to do. And uh, we're just incredibly busy. We're interactive. And so between all the stuff going on in the world and then all the tyranny, the urgent stuff, it can just get, it can get pretty consuming. Um, you know, what's going on in our city? What's going on in our county? What's going on in our state? What's going on around the world? And you can become so consumed with all the different problems of the world. And, and somebody said once that when God created Adam and Eve and put them in a garden, you know, that was like enough concerns right there in the garden, you know, and the, really that's about all our body, bodies can handle, and yet today we have access to everything that's going on all over the world, and brokenness. <laughs> I can talk to you about brokenness. 30 years in youth ministry, um, broken homes, suicidal thoughts, eating disorders, depression, abuse. I have a half-brother um, that's a schizophrenic on the highest dose of medication he can be on that's locked up in a treatment facility in southeast Missouri. But there's a lot of dirt, is there not? A lot of crazy stuff that takes our focus, and people like dirt. People like gossip. Man, they like the bad news. The juicier, the better. But there's good news. <laughs> you just have to look a little bit deeper. You have to want it. You have to long for it. You have to desire it. You have to seek after it, and some of it is have it in our hand at our disposal. And yet we're more consumed by all the bad news than we are the good news that he's given us. I make a habit of reading Proverbs every morning. You know, there's 31 chapters, and today's the 16th, so I'll read Proverbs 16 today because I figure that Solomon had a lot more wisdom than I did do. And so I, I read that because I, I want it. You know, but in our culture, bad news sells and good news is forgotten. I love what this uh, person, Albert Hubbard, said about an editor. An editor is somebody who is employed by a newspaper whose business is to separate the wheat from the chaff and to see that the chaff is printed. Because that's what sells. If you're going to sell a newspaper, don't just put some good story on the front. Put some juicy story on the front, you know? The, the new news that we watch, you know, that we got to get the, the latest and the greatest because that's what gets people coming back. It's, it's a world that's gone crazy. And we are called to be people in the world, but we are not called to be of the world. We're called to focus on the seed in the ground and not the dirt all around. That's what makes us different as followers of Jesus, as followers of Christ, is, is we are learned to focus on the seed in the ground and not the dirt all around. To focus. I, I brought this book, um, Pastor Aaron goes, are you reading Good to Great? And, and not really, I read it a long time ago, but this is a business book, and it's about companies that went from being good companies to being great companies. There's another, comp- there's another book that he wrote called Built to Last, companies that not went from good to great, but stayed good and stayed great. 
And there's another book that he wrote called How the Mighty Have Fallen, Businesses That Went to Great and Then Fell. But, but one of the premises of his book is focus. Companies and organizations, businesses that do well, learn to focus. And whatever you focus on, it enlarges. Southwest Airlines, let's focus, right? Let's focus on being cheaper airfares, let's give them free luggage, let's take care of the customer, and it'll enlarge. Other companies, the same kind of thing. As followers of Christ, I think we can learn something about the idea of let's be focused. And what I want to challenge you this morning is to focus on the seed and not the dirt. Focus on the seed in the ground and not the dirt all around. Paul said it this way in Philippians 2, 14 and 15. Do everything, <laughs> this, hold on, everything without grumbling or arguing. So that you can be blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. And then you will shine like stars in the sky, <laughs> like stars in the universe. That was my three rules when we went on a trip. There was three rules. They're all biblical. First of all, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We're going to worship together. We're going to hear somebody preach. Man, love God with everything you got. Love your neighbors yourself because you're going to be fatigued and you're going to be tired and you're going to get frustrated with the people you're traveling with on that mission trip or at that youth convention or on the youth trip. And the third, <laughs> the hardest, is to do everything without complaining or arguing. Because if we do, we will shine like stars in the universe. So we gather here today to learn how do we focus on the seed in the ground and not the dirt all around. What overwhelms you? This morning, just do, dial it back. But where is the focus of the dirt becoming more predominant in your life? Is it in the political climate? Is it with family issues? Yesterday morning, I met with a guy who had to go to a family reunion. He's like, wow, I'd rather stay here. <laughs> but maybe it's some family stuff. Maybe it's family issues. Is it your workplace? Is it you're consumed with maybe your past mistakes and your past failures? But where are you looking at the dirt all around rather than the seed of hope in the ground? Do you like dirt? <laughs> maybe you're looking at the economy or the mounting debt or relational issues. Or maybe you're one of those people that just like to know the latest gossip. Or are you fixated on the rearview mirror? You know it's about that big, by the way. And the windshield's about this big. And are you looking at that rearview mirror and fixated on all your past mistakes? Like if we get in our car today, I, I challenge you, and then I'll ask you to forgive me later, to try to drive home looking in the rearview mirror. Right? And yet that's, do we not live our lives that way? Going, man, I wish I wouldn't, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. And then we wreck our present because we're so focused on the past. We got to think about the generation behind us, you know, of what we're giving them. I, Andy Stanley, during the whole political climate, says to all the people that are 45 and older, said, stop posting all that stuff on the internet. You're scaring our children. Focus on the seed in the ground and not the dirt all around. Vicki and I had talked to her back in 1986 to going on a three-week bicycle trip from Lake Wells, Florida to Buffalo, New York, uh, 1,425 miles. That's a whole other story. She went with me, um, but it was crazy. But the guy that led that trip, he said, there's a lot of incredible people in the world, but, but people, the 5% gets all the press. So focus on the seed in the ground, not the dirt all around. You know, at church, let me just say this, kind of like my pet peeve lately is, where in the world did we get a spirit of fear? When we serve the God who said, don't, don't have a spirit of fear, but have a spirit of love and power and a sound mind. And I believe it's because we've started focusing so much on the world that we forgot to focus on what Christ calls us to do and calls us to be and how to live and to focus on the seed and not the dirt. You know, you can be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Have you ever heard that? But flip it. We can be so earthly minded that we're not heavenly, no heavenly good. And so the call of us is to, is to step it up and to learn to focus on what is unseen rather, or focus on what is unseen and not only on what is seen. Jesus, man, he went to Jerusalem knowing exactly what he was supposed to do, knew what was going to happen when he got there, but all along the way, man, he was focusing on the things that were unseen. He was focusing on the woman at the well. He was focusing on the woman caught in adultery. He was focusing on all of these people. He was, he was focused on the mission, right? 
I mean, and he knew what was going to happen. I would have been like, man, <laughs> I'd been trying to talk God out of it all the way there. Maybe he was, but, but he was so focused on what he was accomplished to do. Listen to the scripture in John 12. Some of you have your Bibles open or on your, on your phone, but, but listen to this. You know, Jesus' popularity has been increasing. He comes into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. People are waving palm branches, Hosanna, Hosanna. I mean, his popularity is like through the roof, except from the religious people. But he's like, everybody's like wanting to follow him. And it says here in, 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 in John chapter 12, verse 20, there was some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. And they came up to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with the request, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. And so Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus said, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus speaking, unless a kernel of wheat falls in the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, it will produce many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servants will also will be. My Father will honor those who serve me. Unless a kernel of wheat falls in the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus is going, there's one of me, right? <laughs> I got to die. I got to lay my life down on a cross, and when I die, there will be many seeds. So how, many, how much of the world today, you know, the largest... Christian group is Christians. I mean, there's Christians all over the world today because Jesus went to the cross and laid down his life. But we are, you know, we, what the word Christians is, is little Christ, right? We're supposed to reflect Christ. We're supposed to be like Christ. So what are we called to do? If anyone would want to save their life, you have to lose it. But if you seek, if you seek to lose your life, you'll find what life is all about. But if you seek to find life, all about me, all about I, all about, you know... <laughs> then you lose it. So we all have a choice to make, right? We can just live for ourselves, and when you die, you die, right? One seed. Or we can die out to ourselves, focus on the seed in the ground and not the dirt all around, and then um, be multiplied. Let me see if I can give you an illustration. I apologize to the guys that were probably at the men's conference. This is what it looks like in North America. It's like, let's, let's consume, right? We got an ear of corn, let's eat it, Right? Now, somebody smarter than me, somebody might want to do the math on this. You can also take all the kernels off here. You can plant them. They grow a crop. You can take all those seeds, plant them, and grow a crop. And what I believe is that after you do that about six or seven times, you could feed the entire world. So we have to make a decision. Are we going to be those people, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, dies into somebody else? You know, when you come to church on Sunday morning, when you're in your job, your community, your faith, how do we die? M moms, you do it well. You die into the lives of your children. You do it. Natural, you do that. Men, we, we can find places to do that where we mentor somebody younger than us in our business world, where we invest in the neighbor down the street, you know, where we invest in young people that are in the church. The, the children's ministry is doing it right now, investing in children. But it's, so we, we, we forget about ourselves and we begin to invest in other people. In 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, it says, Therefore we do not lose heart. Though hourly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on not what is unseen, but what is unseen. Since what we see is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Say it with me. Focus on the seed in the ground and not the dirt all around. How do you do it, Mark? How do you do this? How, how do we do this? How do I do this? First of all, I believe that to focus on the seed in the ground and not the dirt all around, ground, we have to focus on having intimacy with our Father. That's why we gather in this place. It's kind of recalibrate. We look back at last week and go, man, I, I'm not going to do that last week again. I'm going to do something different, right? And we look at the week to come and go, man, here's some things that I want to do different. But when we spend time with the Lord in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, whenever you do it, whatever, however you do it. You know, I, do, I use this little app that says first 15, you know. So I got 15 minutes I spend with the Lord, you know. It's reading Proverbs. But it's a recalibration to go, God, I want to spend time with you. And I started doing ministry at South Lake Wells Church of God in Lake Wells, Florida, 
almost 30 years ago, actually like 34 years ago, right out of college. I was 22 years old. I did not have a clue. My major was sociology. My minor was missions. I was a youth pastor, so I begged God to show up. And you know what he did? He showed up. Seriously. I mean, every morning, I, I asked Vicki all the time, I said, am I stretching that? And she's here to hold me accountable. She'll tell me, tell, tell me, tell me if it's not true. But I'm an early riser, so 5.30 in the morning, I'm up. I know it's an oxymoron, youth pastor. But 5.30 in the morning, I'm out walking in the woods in Florida, praying, going, God, I need your help, dude. I don't know what I'm doing. God, will you help me, help me, help me? Well, I guarantee you, it's not very different than a lot of your prayers. Sometimes I really felt like I was connecting. Other times I wondered if my prayers were even going any taller than the pine trees. But I would look over my shoulder, and I'd see God's activity. I'd see God growing a student ministry and changing people's lives. I, I took a group of students um, when I was 28 years old to the Soviet Union, military center of the Soviet Union, and God birthed the church. And today there's four congregations in the former Soviet Union military center, Russia, today. Shalom is because of a group of young people. But it was because of this intimacy with the Father. Here's the other thing that happens with the intimacy, intimacy with the Father. I go out, search me, O God, know my heart. Test me, know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. And uh, help me to walk in the, in, 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 in the way everlasting. Mark, you were really short with Vicki yesterday. I know. <laughs> you need to ask her to forgive you. You know, he, 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 he keeps us on the straight. He keeps us on the narrow because we walk out of intimacy. We begin to see, focus on the seed, not the dirt, because we live out of this intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, and it changes everything. It changes everything. I was reading John 14, the last couple verses in John 14. Jesus says this, The prince of this world has, does not have... He, he, let me get it, get it right. Jesus says, I love... The, the prince of this world has no hold on me. Now, wouldn't it be cool if all of us today could say, hey, the prince of this world, Satan himself, does not have a hold on me. But let's be honest. In some parts of our lives, he has more of a hold than we really want him to have, right? The prince of this world has no hold on me, but the world has got to learn that I love my father so much that I'll do exactly what my father tells me to do. And I'm like, God, <laughs> how did you do this? How did you never allow the prince of this world to have his hold on you, and how did you always do what the father is telling you to do? Now, you know what follows John 14, right? You guys help me out. This is not hard. John 14. You know what follows John 14? John 15. <laughs> you know what John 15 says? The first eight verses? I am the vine, you're the branches. If you'll remain in me, I'll remain in you. And apart from me, you can do nothing. So it's this intimacy with the Father where we choose to look beyond the surface to what matters. We begin to focus on the seeds. Corey Ten Boom said it this way, Is prayer your steering wheel, or is it your spare tire? Prayer's the key to keeping us centered on the seed. Don't be anxious about anything, Paul says, but in everything through prayer and supplication, present your request to God, and the peace of God will guard your heart and mind. Paul says in Romans, Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Fix your eyes on God, and he will change you from the inside out. Focus, say it with me, on the seed in the ground and not the dirt all around. The seed view is birthed out of intimacy with Christ. And it, we can also focus on the seed in the ground when we're committed to looking beyond the dirt, beyond the surface. We have to be very intentional to change our focus. You know, when Christ was being crucified and... Um, that Roman soldier, I, I, I was looking it up right before I came up here, that Roman soldier, when he saw Christ being crucified, you know, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. Um, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. Because he saw beyond what was going on out here, right? I mean, you talk about a scene. That was a scene, but that Roman guard saw more. You know, he saw beyond the surface, and he began to, the, not, not the crowds that appeal, but what was real in that moment. See, like I know, I can preach here on Sunday, or Pastor Drew, or whoever fills this pulpit can preach on Sunday, but I know that you can impress people from a distance, but I know impact happens up close. It happens when you begin to have these conversations, and you talk about these things, and, and I also know that if you'll guard your mind, then God will take care of your heart. 
If you'll guard your mind, if you'll protect your mind, then, then God will take care of your heart. But I love this. But we have this treasure in jars of clay, 2 Corinthians um, 4, 7. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. <laughs> this is a jar of clay up here talking this morning, but there's this treasure that we look for that goes beyond the surface. Consider the way Jesus viewed people. What did Jesus see? The little children. You know, hey, he didn't have time for you. <laughs> no, let the little children come to me. Because Jesus saw more than just an interruption. To the demoniac, he spoke to the demoniac. He addressed him. The woman caught in adultery, go, sin no more. And her accusers, whoever is without sin, throw the first stone. Because he knew. To the woman at the well, he talked to her. She'd been married five times, and the person she was with then, was she wasn't married to. And he talked to her, and he treated her as someone that was special. Zacchaeus, hey, come down, Zacchaeus, I'm going to go to your house today. Crowds of people. But he saw something that nobody else saw because he, was, he, was, he saw what was going on in Zacchaeus. To the rich young ruler, he said, sell all you have and give to the poor because he knew that the rich young ruler just kind of had to walk away from it all, right? To the disciples, come and follow me. To Peter, <laughs> who had denied him, <laughs> who, who at one time, he, Jesus said, hey, Satan, get behind me. <laughs> he called him, you're the rock, and on you, I'm going to build the church. Jesus, he made a decision to look beyond the surface and to look deeper into people's lives. And that's, that's our calling, we're little Christ. We're to look beyond what we see to what we don't see. Jesus saw something that others did not see. He focused on the seed and not the dirt. Jesus saw something that others did not see, and we are called to be like him. <laughs> My brothers in India, who I've had a lot of opportunity to be with, they said, Mark, if you're not prophetic, you're prophetic. So I'm going to step out there this morning. You know, we just came through this big political scene. I, in the 1980s, I was at a Jesus festival in Orlando, and uh, I don't remember who the speaker was, but he said this. He said, you know, when the mainline denominations adopted a political platform, they lost their influence in the culture. He says, you mark the word. There's going to be a day when the evangelical church will adopt a political platform, and they will lose their influence in the culture. We can get so focused on things that shouldn't be our focus. I'm not saying it's not important whether you're Republican or Democrat. I'm not saying that, you know, we're a part of this world, but I'm just saying that our, our focus needs to be, be look beyond all the surface stuff to what is going on deep. That's the change is out of intimacy with the Father. In, in youth ministry, I'd heard this. Well, no, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, just, let me share the scripture because it's really good. Um, Hebrews 12, 2. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And he knew what it was about. He didn't forget it. In youth ministry, I knew this from the very beginning, the student that will drive me crazy will be the one that will drive me to their mission station. And there was a lot of times I wanted to give up on some students because you are driving me crazy. I wanted those kids that just sat in Sunday school and said, yeah, no. I didn't want those guys that were all crazy. This kid, David West, Dude, if, if, you can't kick people out of the church, but if I could have, I would have, you know. <laughs> it was like he just drove me crazy, man. David West, he was single mom, and his mom would lock him up in the room, and he'd take the window out and go out and mess around, do things, come back in the I mean, he's a mess. Well, he lives in Argentina now, Portugal before that. Every summer, end of the summer, I get a letter from David West. 400 kids gave their heart to the Lord this summer at youth camps. Life change, you know, but you've got to be able to see beyond the surface, and you got to see down deep. you got to walk with the Father. you got to be intimate with the Father. you got to know the Father. It's, it's this sea view is birthed out of intimacy with the Father. It's birthed out of a commitment to look beyond the surface. And I can't miss this, because this is not, you know, prosperity gospel, name it, proclaim it, all that kind of stuff, because God oftentimes uses dirt. Vicki just reminded me, we were walking in, she goes, you know, it was four years ago today that you were in Paraguay, and my son kicked a soccer ball and hit me in the gut, and I landed on my rear and rolled back on my neck, and uh, then I had a chiropractor um, adjust me a little bit too hard, and I had a hematoma of blood that was grown uh, and pushing against some ruptured disc and my medulla, 
And when I got ready to fly home, the, the airline doctor wouldn't let me fly home. And I had a surgery in Paraguay. Um, earlier that year, I had an E. coli infection. Then I had two ruptured discs. I ended up having surgery in Paraguay. I had a staph infection. I had another surgery. Then I came back to, anyway, it's a long, crazy story. But it was during that time that God said, Mark, you got to stop doing, 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 doing. It is time for you to stop and teach. So like youth pastors used to call me and I'd be like, how can I get them off the phone so I can go back to doing? And it was in those moments that God said, Mark, you, that is your job. Listen, talk, process. It was in those difficult times where God began to show me things. And so God uses dirt. God uses dirt to grow us, to grow things. And so if you're in one of those spots, you know, my child, my parents divorced, you know, it shaped me, it formed me, it helped me to connect with students, it helped me to reach students. I love what Corey Ten Boom said, when a train goes through a tunnel, it gets dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off the train. You sit still and you trust the engineer. In Romans chapter 5, it says not only this, but we rejoice in sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance character and character hope, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has poured out his heart in his heart through the Holy Spirit that he has given us. Say it with me. Focus on the seed in the ground and not the dirt all around. And last of all, we can focus on the seed in the ground when we make it our goal to plant, to water, and to harvest seeds for eternity. This is not an optional activity for a devoted follower of Jesus. We are called to plant. We are called to water. We are called to harvest. And maybe that's in your neighborhood. Maybe that's at your job. Maybe it's in the youth ministry in the church. Maybe it's children's ministry. I don't know what it is for you, but it is not an optional thing. We must be people who go one block over to plant a seed, to water a seed, to harvest a seed. If anyone comes after me, Jesus said, he has to turn away from his selfish ways and to invest. John 12, 24. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. We have become such a consumer society, you know, that we, we, we forget that Jesus is the living water. He's the bread of life. And we get really caught up in worship. And we get caught up in youth ministry. And we get caught up in worship. Men's conferences. <laughs> Do I need to go on? We get, yeah, thanks. Somebody called 911. We get so wrapped up in the container that we forget. Why I'm preaching this morning, I, and I, I'm, I thank God for the church. If it wasn't for the church, I wouldn't be here, right? But had I not left my seat and came down and gave my life to Jesus Christ, I wouldn't be here today. Because Jesus said, I'm the living water. If you drink of me, you will thirst no more. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's always been Jesus. It'll always be Jesus. And it's about him. And um, in and, and, and Mark 4, it says, listen, a farmer went out to plant some seed. That's our job. The Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to himself. We are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do things that God planned for us a long time ago. The seed is birthed out of intimacy with our Father. It's a commitment to look below the surface. Some of the kids, children, young people, people that you work with and are around neighborhood that are driving you crazy, look beyond the surface. If you're going through a really hard time right now, God uses hard times. He uses hard times to grow us. And we are called to plant, to water, to harvest. We have to learn to focus on what is unseen, not only what is seen. Here, here's the seed, seed truth, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 to 18. For our light, <laughs> sometimes they don't feel that way, right? And momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. But what... It, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Say it with me. Say it loud. Focus on the seed in the ground and not the dirt 
all around. That's why we care about those who are less fortunate. It's why we reach out to people that we encounter. That's why for 30 years I invested in teenagers. If you're going to reap a harvest, you have to plant seeds. And we are so busy in the church. We want to see revival. We're, we're praying, God, bring revival to America. But there is no harvest if you don't plant seeds. That's why we're on planet Earth. Not to be so wrapped up in our own agenda that we miss God's agenda. Or not to notice all the dirt around. Jesus said it, if you seek to find life, you'll lose it. But when you seek to give your life away, you will find what it is all about. That's why Jesus said, if you come after me, you have got to put away your selfish ambitions. And that's why people who live like this will never, ever be forgotten. Jesus died on a cross. I guess today it would be an electric chair where every morning we get up, sit down, pull back the letter, die out to ourselves, and we go to live and to serve those people that are around us. I just want to end with one really practical illustration. It's not always easy, but when we live out of that intimacy with Father and where we try to hear His voice, sometimes He calls us to do things that we don't understand, that we don't really get, but we do it. And we trust Him with the results. Because oftentimes God's agenda and God's plans are bigger, better, more incredible than your agenda and your plans. And I'll just illustrate it with this and then we'll wrap up. His, uh, I did youth ministry for 30 years. One of my heroes was Josh McDowell. I don't know if you ever heard of him, but Josh McDowell, his wife came to Christ and Josh said um, she's crazy and sought to prove her wrong and began to study the life of Jesus. And through the study of the life of Jesus, found out that no, <laughs> she's right. And Jesus is more than a carpenter. He wrote a book, millions and millions of copies. I always wanted to meet him. I always wanted to meet him. I was out in Wichita, Kansas. He's speaking. And he's up there and he's, he's speaking. And I'm in the crowd of about 2,000 people. And when he finishes speaking, the worship team comes up. I go out the back door, walk down here, come down the hallway, and he is talking to my senior pastor. And my heart is beating through my chest because I'm going to get to meet Josh McDowell. And I walk up. And these two guys come out of nowhere. They're with Josh. And they say, hey, uh, John's not feeling well, so we're going to call a taxi and take him back to the hotel. And you know what the still small voice does, right? Mark, your car's in the parking lot. They're your guests. You give them a ride. I'm like, God. I wanted to meet this guy forever. What are you talking about? But I did what was right. I wouldn't tell the story if I didn't, right? I said, hey, um, I, uh, I, I'll give you guys a ride. And I walked away from meeting Josh McDowell. I went and got in my car, sat down in the front seat, and uh, said, I'm Mark Shader. I'm the youth pastor here. And the guy in the front seat says, I'm Daryl Scott. And the guy in the back said, I'm John Tomlin. Um, and this is John Tomlin Sr. And uh, you, you may not know those names, but less than a year earlier, um, the shooting out in Columbine happened. And Daryl lost his daughter, Rachel, who was sitting in the front seat. And John Tomlin Sr. lost his son, John Tomlin Jr., in that shooting. And they talked about that 30-minute ride of what it was like to be in that um, gym when they started calling out names and people getting reconciled back to their children and their names not getting called and realizing they had lost their kids. Um, God's agenda that day was bigger than mine. I mean, I'm riding across there going, who's Josh McDowell? <laughs> I mean, I'm sitting with these guys hearing firsthand this story that's a very painful story. And, um, but Daryl told the story about his daughter coming home from a youth retreat, just like you guys came home, and said, I'm not going to go back to doing life as normal. I'm going to not sit with all my Christian friends, but I'm going to sit with all those people who have to sit by themselves. I'm going to carry my Bible to school. And uh, she began to do that, and about a month later, she went to her daddy, and she says, Daddy, it is not as much fun as I thought. All my church friends are making fun of me because I don't sit with them anymore. And because I carry my Bible to school, I think like I'm better than everybody else. And Daryl grabbed a plant out of the window and uh, took a seed and said, Honey, if you're going to live this life, you've got to learn to focus on the seed and not the dirt. And then she did. She continued to live that life. And when that Columbine um, shooting happened, she was one of the people that was targeted and went to the heaven. But I'm telling you today, church... Um, that if we're going to be the people of God, say it with me, we have got to focus on the seed in the ground and not the dirt all around. I do not know how God is speaking to you today. I don't even want to pretend to know. Maybe it's a calling to be more intimate with him. Maybe it's a calling to say, I've been looking at all this stuff on the surface. I've got to start looking deeper. Maybe it's that I'm in the middle of a bunch of dirt, and instead of trying to get through it, I need to go, God, what are you trying to teach me? Maybe it's that I just need to start planting some seeds 
and some water and some seeds and harvest and some seeds. I really don't know where you are today, but I'm going to invite you to stand and I'm going to pray over you and I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Aaron. But the children of Israel, um, it says that they forgot, they hardened their heart because they forgot what God had done. And so my prayer for you today is that if God is speaking to you, do not harden your heart. And if you only remember one thing that you carry through this week, what would happen if all of us walked out of here today and focused on the seeds in the ground and not the dirt all around? And uh, so when you walk out there to what a friend of mine says, the block top of forgetfulness, please don't forget. God has called us to something greater, and he wants to use you at levels that you never even dreamed. But you've got to be willing to be that seed that will fall on the ground and die. Otherwise, you'll just remain a single seed.